Hello, and welcome to another conversation on climate. Today we're speaking to James Samworth, Randall Peterson. Professor Jane Stout, the Right Honourable Chris Skidmore. It's hard to believe we're already here. It feels just like yesterday when the camera started to roll, our director called action, and I asked my first ever question as host of Conversations on Climate. If he'd asked me then what I wished for the project, getting to a milestone like this would have been top of the list. We've now put out 50 full-length episodes. That's more than two full days of the most inspiring, insightful, and powerful sustainability conversations with some truly outstanding guests. I'm so proud of this body of work, and I can't wait to show you our plans to make the next 50 bigger and better. But today, I want to pick out some highlights from the journey so far. One thing I didn't expect from the podcast was how much it would teach me about climate leadership. These intimate chats with the world's foremost experts have felt like a cheat code for the coaching program of my dreams. It's been an enormous privilege and one I'd love to share with you all. So here I've gone back through all 50 of our episodes and picked the five moments one from each set of 10 that taught me the most. Each is from a different business school professor at the very top of their game. I need to revolutionize the way I think about ESG in a different way. Will they do the same for you? Well, let's find out. To start, I went all the way back to episode five with Professor JP Benoit. Because before we can solve climate change, we first need to understand the forces behind it. A world expert in behavioral economics and game theory, JP blew my mind with the concept of climate change as a rational accident before laying out why he thinks democracy will uniquely struggle to find solutions. But could you explain what, like the first step, what is a rational accident? Yeah, so let's, let's just think of some accidents. Okay, so uh, the BP Gulf oil spill or the space shuttle exploding or um, rogue traders, which I might call an accident in the sense of broadly of just a wrong thing occurring. Okay? Or a doctor is administering the wrong medication. You know? So we can just think of all these things, Three Mile Islands, lots of things. Okay? And a typical analysis would say, okay, well, so, so what went wrong? So is it that the company is prioritizing profits over safety? Okay? Is it that the workers just don't care or they're lazy? You know, or they're distracted, you know, or something like that. Okay? Uh, let me fix the errors that were made, the errors that were being made. Okay? And that's what we might call, a, let me call it an irrational accident or just an accident. So what do I mean by irrational accident? I mean, no, let me, it, it is possible that actually the workers are doing everything right. Okay, and we'll come back to what I mean by that. And they actually care. It's not that they're lazy and that they care about the action. Everything is right. But somehow, when it's right, it's like individually it's the right thing for me to do. But when we all individually do the right thing, it's the wrong thing. Okay? If we all coordinated it, it would be the wrong thing. Okay? So let me just give an example. Let me, not exactly an, uh, an accident, but maybe this has happened to you. You have a meeting you know, at your company, and there are 15 of you. And, and you're going to make a decision, maybe hire someone, I don't know. And there's a 20-page memo you're supposed to read. It's long, okay? So you get there, you read it, you've read it, you're ready to prepare, and then people start to talk, and you know what? All the points you're gonna make, four other people have made them already, okay? And you're like, but why did I waste my time reading that memo? <laughs> I mean, I could have been better off not reading the memo. Now, actually I said I could have been better off, but that's not what I mean. I don't mean that like I could have been out clubbing instead or watching TV or having dinner with my wife. Okay. Suppose now I'm a good worker. Okay. What I think is I could have done something better for the company. That's a better use of my time. You see, it's not like I'm making a mistake. It is literally was a better use of my time not to read the, those memos. Okay. But the problem is when we all think that way, <laughs> nobody reads the memo. Okay. And now we're going to say, oh, wait a second. We were all trying to do the bad thing. This in sense, some sense, and I'll come back to that again. Nothing was done wrong. Okay. Now, if I look at accident reporting, okay, the shuttle, uh, chemical plants, and a lot of things, and you see careful an analyses, you'll often hear this phrase, it was an accident waiting to happen. And what does that mean, it was an accident waiting to happen? Well, there were all these procedures that should have been followed, and half of them weren't followed. Okay? And if I look at a, like a chemical plant, 
So chemical plants use deadly chemicals. It's not because someone came in and flipped the wrong switch. You know, they're not that stupid. They're like seven different safety things, you know. There's an alarm that should go off, and there's a heating blanket, and someone should be te- checking the temperature gauge, and this and this and this and this. There's a lot of things that need to go wrong, okay? But then you look and you see, you know what? A lot of them weren't being followed, okay? I look at the space shuttle. There's a very definite procedure, safety. They weren't being followed, okay? And then I go, why not? Okay. Well, now I'll come back to the memo. And I go, yeah, you know what? They should all be followed. But actually, this one doesn't need to be followed if the others are being followed. Okay. And in the sense, there's a lot of redundancy built in there, but the redundancy itself, which makes it safer, makes me not really need to put in the effort. Uh, in the sense, again, for the company, that I could be doing something else to make the company safer than being the 14th person to check something that's been checked 13 times, okay? Like too many redundancies are working against us. That sense it's a rational accident. And can you see any parallels with that uh, with climate change? Yeah, so I'll give you a parallel and a, and a non-parallel. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm-hmm. part of what I've said is, is kind of like a free, what's called a free rider problem, right? Why mm-hmm. should I read the memo when you've read the memo? Okay, and if I look at climate change, one of the things that makes it very difficult is we know we all have to reduce, we all have to reduce, but actually, if everyone else reduces, then I don't really need to reduce, you know? Even the United States, as big as it is, if all the other countries really went down, and the United States went down just a little bit, maybe that would be good enough, you know? So that's like a free rider problem. What I'd like to do is do less and let you worry about it, okay? There's the costs are being placed on everybody else, and I'm going to ignore that. Okay? And that really drives climate change a lot. That's a, a lot of the problem. Because we can have all the discussions, discussions and in the end, I kind of want to walk away and say, you know, my oil well is fine. <laughs> you know, let somebody else take care of the problem. And then we're screwed when everyone thinks that way. Do you think that democracy is up to the task? So one difficulty is, you know, and I said we're moving in the right direction, right? Mm-hmm. But one difficulty is the scientists tell us we're not kind of moving fast enough. You know, and, and that makes these kind of problems more urgent. It's like we don't really have 80 years to move in the right direction, you know. Another way we have a problem is when we have a small chance of a very bad outcome. Okay. So there I see if someone goes, oh, I don't know, you're exaggerating climate change. There's only a 20% chance. And I go, a 20% chance the planet will be destroyed? That's huge. <laughs> You can't focus on the 20%. You have to focus on, on put that together. But we're not very good at doing that. You know? So that all makes it very, very difficult. And you say, it might happen, it might not, then you're really not sure what to do. And you really want someone to give you advice. This will happen, that won't happen. This is the right thing, sort of before the fact and after the fact. You know? And that's not going to be the case. Okay? And it makes all the decisions a lot worse okay, in, in lots of ways. Okay, so let me give another example. I don't know if you remember Hurricane Katrina. Of course. Right, so you know, wiped out New Orleans. Okay? Mm. And there was woefully inadequate preparation. Okay? And this kind of motivation for one of my papers. You know? And they say, well, why? Why did the government not prepare? What does he say? So it was like a Category 5 hurricane. And if I look and I do the math, and if I look at a president's term, and I say, well, what was the chance a Category 5 hurricane would strike within that term? Something like even two terms, something like 5%, if I remember correctly. So that's really low. But it's a real disaster. It's not low meaning you shouldn't prepare. It's, me- it's low meaning you should prepare. But it's low meaning that if I do prepare and I come up for election and say, well, don't worry, I spent a lot of money preparing for a hurricane, they go, hurricane? There was no hurricane. What kind of an idiot are you? Okay. And the opponent who comes says, don't worry about it. Who's looking right? The person who said, don't worry about it, or the person who said, worry about it? You know? And that makes our decision making very bad. Don't panic. We also had guests who are more optimistic about climate politics. Let's jump ahead to episode 47 with Professor Alex Edmonds. We had a fascinating discussion about the problem of polarization around climate and diversity and the role of identity in evaluating evidence. And I have to be honest, Alex's responses surprised me. See what you think. 
data and evidence can never be considered in a vacuum. They often come with identities and cultural meanings. And so this is the, the case for, for climate change. So one of the best documentaries on climate change, very fact-based, very well-researched, was An Inconvenient Truth. But because this starred Al Gore, this immediately meant that some Republicans thought, well, this is something that I shouldn't be believing. Only people like them, Democrats, are believing. And so this failed to disentangle the actual evidence from the identity. Similarly, there was a video which says 97% of scientists believe that man-made climate change is real. Ted Cruz does not. Ha ha, let's laugh at Ted Cruz for being a climate change denier. But then this meant that this is something that a true Republican should be skeptical about. And people like the them versus us underdog story. This might lead some Republicans to think, OK, we are here in a minority. There might be some misinformation being peddled. There are some true believers who are willing to fight the good fight like Ted Cruz who are supporting. Um, this this, this anti-misinformation campaign and I should support it myself. So then climate change does not become an example, a, an issue of what is true, but which side are you on? Do people like us or people like them believe it? So what is the antidote to this? Well, firstly, it could be to for the climate change message to be given by somebody neutral or actually by some Republicans. So there have been Republican politicians who've set up bodies trying to highlight the importance of climate change and how everybody should take action against this because it's a global issue. It's not an issue of identity politics. Also, you might highlight how the solution to climate change are not things such as taxation and regulation, which Republicans might be sceptical towards, but Republican values of innovation, ingenuity, coming up with things such as hydrogen planes or ways to capture carbon and store it in deep geological rock formations. And so that's something which accords with Republican values and makes them much more willing to hear the evidence for what it is, rather than thinking the evidence is from an agenda that they should be opposed to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there, there was a point in time where climate change wasn't particularly political. You had people for, for their own reasons mm -hmm. wanting on both, both sides of the aisle uh, wanting to, to take a particular stance. Is it too late to imagine a world where it can be depolarized? I don't think so. And so this is why, so, so what I'm trying to highlight in the book is there's relatively simple solutions here. We don't require everybody to get PhDs in environmental science. I don't have myself or PhDs in statistics, but just to make sure that the messaging is detached from um, the, uh, the actual identity. Mm, okay. Um, but we also bear in mind that, um, that there's an awful lot of kind of Special interests and extra and an awful lot of money uh, coming into this from from uh, from from particular groups, particular nations. Um, how do we kind of navigate that path where you may be thinking uh, on one side, going, "Well, we're we're, we're well-meaning, we're trying to um, trying to kind of solve this issue," but on the other side, you've got an awful lot of money who are sitting there protecting their own interests. So how do you how do you deal with um, you know, holding? politics to account for kind of that type of special interest? I think it's to step into other people's shoes and show empathy, which is something which is often missing from these discussions where we want to ridicule the other side. So let's think about, well, what might Republicans care about? They might care about their companies being extremely successful in the long term. So this is why when I come to, and I give a lot of talks on sustainability and grow the pie to companies, how do I give those talks? I don't try to guilt trip them into saying, you need to do this, you have a moral obligation. Who am I to tell you what your moral obligations are? My morals might not be better than yours, but I'm saying based on some evidence, this is good for your company's long-term success. Um, one of the points that you, you, you make in the book is that um, evidence actually isn't everything. Are, are we being kind of too focused on uh, trying to boil everything down in an ESG sense into, into numbers, into, mm -hmm. in, into data? Isn't there a place for, um, for, for, for you know, philosophy? Isn't there a, there a place for different type, types, of, types of ethics? ethics? Um, that, and we judge it upon, we judge particular standards, particular ideas on, on ethical principles or philosophical principles rather than trying to, trying to get it down into numbers. Absolutely. So, so I think too many times we try to highlight sustainability by looking at the financial case. And I have to admit myself, I sometimes use that case. I say, well, there's certain dimensions of sustainability where the evidence suggests it is financially profitable in the long term, 
But I also admit this is not true for every type of sustainability. So let's take diversity, equity, inclusion. So sometimes people will boil this down to just demographic diversity, and they'll quote McKinsey or BlackRock studies showing that demographic diversity pays off. Unfortunately, it doesn't. So those um, pieces of research have major flaws in them, but are accepted uncritically due to confirmation bias. But let's say they were true. Right? If people are only doing diversity because you make money out of it, then they might do gender and ethnic diversity. But is there any study showing that diversity in terms of inclusion of disabled people improves financial returns? Or socioeconomic diversity if you hire people who are first generation college students? Or diversity in appearance? Right? How many tattooed people do you see working for investment banks? Uh, and there's no study showing that that is a, a, a dimension of, of, of diversity. So if we only reduce it to what we can show with particular data, there might be other things that we might want to pursue where there is no data behind it, and so we don't do this. And just in life, we do many, many things for non-financial reasons or non-instrumental reasons. So why might you play football rather than rugby? It is not through scientific evidence showing that the effect of football is better on your health, nor that through football you meet more wealthy people and this is now a better network to help you get jobs in the future. You might just love football, right? Or football is just closer to you, it's more convenient. You might make decisions out of convenience rather than the impact on your future earnings. And so I think for certain things in sustainability where there is no evidence or the only evidence there is not particularly reliable, you might just say, I want my organisation to have a diverse mix of people. I think this is the right thing to do, not I'm going to do this because I'm going to make more money out of it. Beyond political culture wars, there's another kind of polarisation that's holding us back. And that's the conflict between ecology and economics. For all the talk of ESG and financial markets, we're still struggling to reconcile an ecological way of seeing the world with the models and systems that run the world today. Enter Jane Stout, Professor of Botany at Trinity College Dublin, with a masterclass in how natural capital accounting can resolve this tension. Taking kind of the language of business, like mm. where you, you look at things like, you know, homogenization, simplifi simplification, there tend, tend to be sort of seen as positives. You're mass, produ you're mass producing, you're, you're yep. reducing costs, whatever else. But those are words that, you know, that are, you know, that, that are climate and, and, and mass production and simplification and homogenization, these are all the problems. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, they're measures of biodiversity loss. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and they are the causes of biodiversity loss. Uh, so simplification of a landscape uh, you think about uh, the old-fashioned farm with with all the different kinds of you know a field for the cows and a field for the I don't know chickens a field for for for, for potatoes uh, little bits of woodland little uh, drainage ditches and streams and and you know there's 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 diversity there uh, it's not very efficient for the farmer so we've become obsessed in in economic growth and efficiency and you know so clear all of that out and plant it all with the same thing and manage it all exactly the same way much more efficient economically much more damaging environmentally so our sort of the way our economic systems and our business models have evolved are very contrary to nature and I think what we need to do, and coming back to this idea of biocircularity, um, is, is take our inspiration from nature. You know, everything in nature is recycled, everything. You know, the energy comes in from the sun, there's production, consumption, and recycling. That's what an ecosystem is, and that's what it does. So we need to take that inspiration uh, and not the, the, the post-industrial um, paradigm of, of, of take, make, dispose. Because that worked when there was, you know, fewer human beings on this planet. But now there's way too many of us, and that's that's not going to work. So, it's I think taking inspiration from nature, for, but looking forward to how we apply that. There's a kind of fundamental conflict there. <laughs> you know, there's I, I like you kind of wonder whether it's even reconcilable. Well, one of the things that you have been, um, have, well, we, we, we touched on earlier on, is the whole idea of like nat uh, natural capital. Yeah. Um, how do you think that that can help to reconcile these issues in a place like Ireland? So the 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 whole point of the natural capital concept is to bring together environmental and economic 
systems. So we can use the concept of natural capital to create, um, uh, to, to systematize environmental data uh, and bring it up alongside economic data because all our decisions are made on, on economic data and, 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 and they don't necessarily reflect and, and, and have uh, obviously caused uh, the environmental damage that we see. So, so the idea of, of the natural capital approach and, and we can, uh, in the same way that we can account for uh, economic data through uh, national accounts, system of national accounts, through GDP and, and things that people think they're familiar with, um, we can do the same sort of thing for our, our environmental data and, and, and bring them alongside each other. And that's, that's the whole premise of natural capital accounting, uh, is to bring our environmental data alongside our, our economic data and, and stitch them together. And to try and make this explicit link between our natural resources, the benefits we get from them, the values we have in our economic system and, 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 and the people who, who use them. I do hope at some point in the future there will be, you know, that you'll listen to the radio, if there is a radio at that time, <laughs> and uh, you won't just be hearing about GDP numbers, you'll also be hearing about, about yeah. you know, natural capital And I think too. that's the problem is we're, you know, everyone thinks they know what GDP is. Um, I don't think they do. It's reported on the radio like we should all be experts in, in uh, national accounts, and we're not. Um, it's, you know, and there's, there's, there's all sorts of things that are reported daily on the radio about financial markets and yeah, we don't know what that means. Most people don't really know what that means. Uh, why don't we have a report every day that tells us about uh, the, the environment and, and, and what's going up and what's going down and, and you know, we've, we've, heard, we've heard this summer about the hottest month, the driest month, the wettest month. Um, we, we're starting to hear those things, but it's not every day. It's not a standard part of every news bulletin, whereas the economic stuff is. So even bringing it up into every conversation, um, you know, we, we, we have a pollen count. I mean, that's kind of a start, <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, it's, I, think, I think we just need to really elevate it to, to, to the level of importance that it that it that it has yeah and yeah like the mere idea that economic growth is more important than you know the health of the nation it to me is completely absurd yeah. but modern economic theory was developed at a time where there were way fewer people and way more resources on the planet um and and infinite growth is not possible on a finite planet and we don't have other planets i mean there are other planets we can't live on them we can't breathe on them um you, you know, it, 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 sometimes I do wonder, but I think it's fabulous to explore our solar system and, and, and you know, just to, for the curiosity, that's what makes us human. But the effort and the, the resources that are put into that could be put into looking after the one planet that we do have. Um, and, and, and the way that our lifestyles are and the way that most other people on the planet would wish their lifestyles to be requires more resources than our planet has. So our modern approach and economic way of doing things doesn't make sense. Just, it just doesn't make physical sense. Um, and so there has to be a change. Yeah. Or, or what's, the, what's the alternative? Yeah, we all naturally stop growing when we hit 18, 19. If we didn't, <laughs> like we'd be five times taller when we're 100 years old. And that is just not... There's like always the, limits to growth. It has to be, yeah, yeah. it has to be. And that was the, you know, that was the, the title of that, that influential report back in the last century at this stage, you know, the limits to economic growth. It's, we were on a finite planet. One of the problems of talking about economic growth and development is that it is so unequally distributed. The world just needs to stop growing. What about all the victims of climate change in the Global South who still haven't caught up? What I loved about my next guest is how he invites us to park that pity and to start seeing developing countries as sources of climate solutions instead. Here, from episode 30, is Professor Rajesh Chandy, talking about the most exciting idea I've heard in years, compressed change. I was recently in my hometown, uh, Cochin, India, and uh, when you uh, land in Cochin, India, you see this giant uh, wall that says, the world's first 100% solar powered airport. Yeah? And when you look outside, it's like this mass, you know all airports have large amounts of land uh, 
for various reasons, I suppose. Uh, but much of the land in Cochin Air International Airport is covered by solar farms. The greatest needs when it comes to these matters uh, also exist um, in developing countries. It's one thing for us to be talking about climate change sitting here in freezing London, or indeed whether or not it'll snow tomorrow, um, or whether the summer will be hotter than usual, whether we'll need to buy air conditioners or whatever. It's another to be living, literally choking, in pollution. Um, where you know your child's life expectancy is going down literally every time he or she steps out of the, uh, of the door. So these are not nice to have or if we don't do it today, bad things will happen 20 years or 50 years from now. These are present and very real uh, issues that are being confronted there. And we as humans deal with problems by come, trying to come up, come up with solutions. Some that, some that require resources, and as, uh, as developing countries have become wealthier, they've managed to uh, cobble together more resources. But some that require ingenious uh, ways of using existing technology resources to do new things, what we call leapfrogging, where you take you know, solar panels that were not invented in Kenya, um, but apply those in an ingenious way that allows pay-as-you-go solar in a distributed manner, which is like stuff of you know, dreams. Uh, <clears throat> So the biggest challenges facing the world actually, when it comes to climate change, actually exist uh, today in developing countries. And so it's not surprising that some of the most exciting innovations are coming out of there as well. Um, that includes innovations um, that by large companies and government entities that are trying to solve those issues. Um, so the International Solar Association, Federation, which is a grouping of well, over 100 odd countries, uh, is headquartered in New Delhi. Uh, why? There's, these are the sunshine countries, you know, who actually have sunshine, unlike sometimes uh, uh, where we live here in London. Um, and the needs are the greatest. And, um, and so I have uh, great hope uh, in the developing world not just being, you know, an object of our sympathy, but the source of our inspiration. Mm -hmm. And that's already happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, the concept of, kind of leapfrogging is, kind of, is quite related to the concept of um, uh, compressed uh, yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah. How, 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 how the two... So this is a, a concept, uh, the idea of compressed change uh, is one that uh, my colleague Om Narasimhan and I proposed a few years ago. So imagine uh, you're a consumer here in London and uh, you are banking in its current form, form of banking arrived 100 odd years ago or more. Electricity arrived 100 odd years ago, uh, telephones arrived. Now imagine the life of a Kenyan villager. Highways arrived in the last 10 years. Electricity arrived in the last few years. Um, telephones arrived. Uh, all of these miraculous things, like almost like magic things, arrived all in the space of one compressed period. So things that happen over a long period are actually happening in developing countries in a very short period. You alluded to the power of compounding. That, that the integration of all of these things, the possibilities of um, what's called, in a rather academic jargon, 
recombinant innovation, which is you're combining all these trajectories together to create something new. Um, that exists in a manner um, that has never been seen before, ever. Uh, this level of compressed change has never been seen uh, ever. So this gives great hope uh, for new businesses, new products, new business models, uh, and indeed new ways of living, uh, which we're seeing. And it's all driven by the fact that profoundly important needs uh, remain unfulfilled uh, in these places. And increasingly, people are demanding uh, through their wallets uh, or through their voices um, change uh, to add that fulfills those needs. Mm. And it's also em empowering you know, masses, massive amounts of people whose voices couldn't have been heard you know, not so long ago. Correct. And, and they could be, you know, the Chinese electric industry, electric car industry is powerful uh, and arguably the largest today for a bunch of reasons, including the fact that China was, until recently, and in some ways still, suffering some of the worst effects of uh, air pollution uh, and uh, water pollution in the world. They have the most intense needs. It's not an abstract concept. The same applies in India, in Africa, and other places. But they have, those needs are very palpable today. Finally, I have to end on my conversation with the professor behind the most popular class at the Yale School of Management, Zoe Chats. I won't spoil it any further, but it was my most inspiring moment of the podcast so far. Without it, we might not still be here getting ready for the next 50 episodes to come. May you too find your army of angels when you need them most. And I'll see you for episode 100. So... I ended up through another circuitous route, but being a brand manager for Barbie at Mattel and running the $200 million segment of the number one girls brand in the world. And it was a crazy time and it was super exciting, weird, fun, educational, but I had a sense of dissatisfaction because um, I would accidentally ended up there. It wasn't my dream to be there. My mom, by the way, didn't even let us play with Barbies. She was a feminist and you were not allowed to have Barbie dolls in the house. So, that, well, that's probably how I did it. But um, I had the words of this leadership professor kept echoing in my head while I was a brand manager. And this was Morgan McCall, my leadership professor when I was an MBA student at USC. And he said, choose a career that you would sacrifice your life for because you will. And I'm sitting there selling Barbie dolls. We're selling two of them a second. And I'm asking, what would it look like to be really successful? Are we selling three Barbie dolls a second? Girls in the U.S. were receiving five in a year. You know, these petroleum products, they, you know, end up chopping off their hair, taking off their clothes. You can never get them back on again. And then they just go to a landfill. So um, I, when I had that frame of... I'm going to sacrifice my life for this. I couldn't stay in right. that career. And I decided to join academia to research and teach and try to help people make better decisions and try to help people understand influence as I was learning about it myself. You, if you're speaking to uh, someone who is, might be thinking of entering into the field of, you know, of, of persuasion or entering into fields of, uh, with particular with the climate bent, um, could you say, like, why should the student of tomorrow be, you know, pursue this? Like, why influence and particularly influence in it with the climate bent? Influence is what is going to change the world, solve the climate crisis. Influence is what makes almost anything important happen. It's not like you have to focus your whole entire life and career on studying influence. It's Whatever it is that you want to make, whatever change you make in the world, even just whatever difference you want to make for your own self, your family, your community, your organization, it influences the way that you get there. So there is no other way. There is no other way. And I'm excited to be able to help interest and inspire some people to be a little bit more mindful about studying 
and learning about influence to practice it so that we're not, like we said at the beginning, leaving influence in the hands of the power hungry. <laughs> it's a really, really beautiful, beautiful line you wrote was um, sometimes we succeed and sometimes our hearts break open. I guess that, that was, that, that was that's a really, really lovely line. Could you go on, unpack that a little bit? You seem to be talking about a subtle connection between success, failure and feeling. That feeling. And uh, when I wrote that in my book, I was, this is in the last chapter, and I was just crying while I was writing the last chapter. And then when I read it in the audio book, I was crying while I was reading it aloud. Because there's this beauty and connection that we get to tap into this deep, deep well of interconnection and empathy that we have as we work on something as big a problem as the climate crisis. And there are so many stumbles and failures along the way. But when we're in it together, we pick each other up. And it's not that we don't fall, but we pick each other up. We dust off our dirt, wipe off the blood, and we keep moving forward. And there's this idea that I feel really strongly about that if we are not in that situation, of failing sometimes, we definitely set our sights too low. And in the climate crisis, none of us knows exactly what it's going to take. We don't even know exactly what it's going to look like to succeed. Just that a lot of us know that it's taking way more than we're doing and succeeding is going to take way longer than we want it to. So we don't need to plan for failure or hope for failure. There are all kinds of fails on that path. And I think we can have some empathy and some compassion for ourselves and for each other where let's not hold ourselves up to some perfect standard. Like look at 350.org, the organization that I'm supporting with some of the profits from my book. They named, they took a stand when they named themselves 350 because that's the the limit for the amount of carbon that we can have in the atmosphere and have things still be okay. We hadn't gotten there when they started their organization and now we've far surpassed it. So their conversations where people keep asking them, are you going to change the name of your organization? Is that a failure? No, it's a reality. There's nothing that's changed about the number 350. And this is, this is still such an important marker. And there, yeah, there's, failure and tears, bloodshed, death along the way of doing everything that we can to solve the climate crisis. And that's, that's the reality that once we can accept it, we move forward and we do this in solidarity with each other. Mm, yeah. It takes all of us. JP Benoit, kind of the uh, uh, wonderful economics professor. The um, way he was framing, framing the conversation was, if you're talking to people who are, who mightn't be believers. What he suggested was, well, even if they believe that there's a 10% chance or a 12% chance of there being a catastrophic failure, isn't that enough? Like if it's just such a bad, like such a bad outcome, shouldn't you be trying to do everything you can to try and avoid even a small chance of a bad outcome? Because if it happens, it is so bad. You should be yeah. trying, trying, trying to move, move, move ahead and do it. You've talked quite a lot about getting out of the kind of the, the solo hero you know mentality and moving towards kind of ar and armies of angels and how how we need to be um you know getting you know in this together um and how only an army of angels can be solving these the, you know these these big existential problem, problems that we have uh, would you have a kind of a, a rallying cry for the you know the, for people who might might be listening and might be be willing to become a part of that army of angels. The army of angels is collective action, mm -hmm. right? And to invite an individual we know to do something with us together is one of the most powerful things that we can do. And this is where involvement and in going to rallies can really really help. So a lot of people don't go to protests because they feel like it doesn't do anything. It's not influencing politicians. It's not change. It's just all of these people showing up and feeling like they're taking action. But bringing someone with you 
to a direct action shows yourself that you care deeply enough to take your time and your energy and bring this person and it gives this other person a direct experience of being with and talking to other people who care deeply enough about this issue to take action. So what I would say just for each person, if you don't know exactly what your next step is, show up to, to a direct action and don't be alone. Bring somebody with you. So we're extraordinarily fortunate to be living in a time where our actions can make a real difference. The conversation that you won't want to miss.